a brief of the Ten Commandments. Have thou no other gods but me, unto no image bow thy knee. Take not the name of God in vain, nor Sabbath day do thou profane. Honor thy father and mother too, and see that thou no murder do. From whoredom keep thee pure and clean, and steal not though thy state be mean. See that thou no false witness bear, and covet not thy neighbor's gear. O Lord, our souls to thee convert, and write thy laws into our heart. Hello and welcome everybody to a new video from Jörg, Joggler 66, Hour of the Truth. Today on the 28th of October 2017, the last Sabbath before Reformation Day, will be the anniversary for the 500th time. <laughs> Sometimes English is a difficult language to me. <laughs> so this is the last Sabbath before we will celebrate the 500th anniversary of Reformation Day, 31st of October 1517. I've come here to the microphone to read to you another part of Martin Luther's book Against the Roman Papacy and Institution of the Devil. And I'm sure that we will read quite some pages of this book, even probably today, but when I start with reading this part one, as you probably remember last time we read that Martin Luther said that I wanted, uh, he wanted to cover three things. First, whether it is true that the Pope in Rome is the head of Christendom above councils, emperors, angels, etc., as he boasts. We are now starting this part one on page 290 for everyone who reads along in his own copy of the book of Luther's works, volume 41, Church and Ministry. When I start reading this, I can tell you already right now that we will go into a quote-unquote great controversy. <laughs> and I carefully selected this word great controversy because this relates to Seventh-day Adventist teaching. And I have learned and studied so much about the true word of God that I can full-heartedly say today in 2017 that the Seventh-day Adventist Church is one of the biggest deceivers in this world. Which parts they actually deceive on, it is subtle. It is so subtle and it is so deep that telling you this right now, this would require more than one broadcast alone. But there is also proof in the Bible that their teaching of the explanation of Daniel's 2300 days is completely wrong, absurd. They have this diabolical teaching of an investigative judgment which is nowhere in the Bible justified. And um, I probably will make an own video on that someday. And also they teach that the 1260 year reign of the Antichrist, the three and a half years or 42 months or 1260 year days from different parts of the Bible and the prophecy, were lasting between 538 and 1798. And even though that this is not such diabolical lie that they teach there, it is still not the truth. And we will come to that right when we start here, part one of Luther's book. Because there are three people that are very dear to me, who are not Seventh-day Adventists, who have never even been in touch with Seventh-day Adventists, and they teach a completely different 1260 day year prophecy. And we will learn of that in this book. And who are those three people? Well, the first is of course Martin Luther, because we are reading his work here. The other one is Henry Gretton Guinness from the wonderful book, among others of course, Romanism and the Reformation. And the third one is Alexander Hislop, who published his book, The Two Babylons, in 1853, nine years after the founding of the quote-unquote Seventh-day Adventist, he had nothing to do with them. Neither did Henry Gerton Guinness. 
who published Romanism and the Reformation about 1887. But, without any further ado, right now I'll come to the point and read to you from page 290 of the book Roman, uh, Against the Roman Papacy and Institution of the Devil by Martin Luther. It is very easy to prove, part one starts here, that the Pope is neither the commander of or head of Christendom, nor lord of the world above emperor, councils and everything as he lies, blasphemes, curses and raves in his decretals, to which the hellish Satan drives him. He himself knows full well, and it is clear as the dear son from all the decrees of the ancient councils, from all the histories, from the writings of the Holy Fathers, Jerome, Augustine and Cyprian, and from all of Christendom before the first Pope, who was called Boniface III, that the Bishop of Rome was nothing more than a bishop, and should still be that. Now, the first Pope was called Boniface III, Martin Luther says here. And when we go into footnote number 66, it says Boniface III convinced King Phocas to acknowledge Rome as, quote, the head of all churches, unquote, caput omnium ecclesiarum. Eh? Caput doesn't mean, like in German, caput broken, but it means capital. Eh? Omnium ecclesiarum means the head of all churches. And this is why Luther calls him the first pope. And we will first continue a little bit in the book, and then I will go into the explanation why the 1260-year prophecy, the three and a half years, the 42 months, is not between 538 and 1798, but is between 606 and 1866. We will read that right away. But Martin Luther here calls Boniface III the first pope. He said that the Bishop of Rome was nothing more than a bishop and should still be that. Yeah? When I read the sentence again, for better understanding, he himself, the Pope, knows full well, and it is, clear, uh, it is as clear as the dear son from all the decrees of the ancient councils, from all the histories, from the writings of the Holy Fathers, Jerome, Augustine, and Cyprian, and from all of Christendom before the first Pope, who was called Boniface III, that the Bishop of Rome was nothing more than a bishop, and should still be that. St. Jerome dared to say freely, quote, All bishops are equal, all together they have inherited the throne of the apostles, unquote, and adds the example, quote, as the bishop of a small city, like Ingubium and Rome, Regium and Constantinople, Thebes and Alexandria. Unquote. He says that one is higher or lower than another because one bishopric is richer or poorer than the other. Other than this, they are all equally the successors to the apostles, so he says. This, I say, the Pope in Rome knows perfectly well, and he also knows that St. Jerome wrote this, and as proof it is contained in the Decretum, as we read in Decreti Prima Pars, um, XC3, so this is uh, 93, C26, 26, these are the uh, the links that Martin Luther lays, lays to the different decretals of the Pope, as we read in uh, Decretal 93, still the Pope dares to lie so brazenly and blasphemous, uh, blasphemously against it and deceive the whole world. Now, let me go now, after finishing this very first paragraph, into an explanation why it is 606 and not 
538. For that we turn to the book of Alexander Hislop, um, The Two Babylons. And uh, I'm going to turn to a part that is in the PDF on page 206. And that PDF you can download for free from the internet. And we read on the bottom of that page, quote, But to return to the apostolic symbols, it was out of the mouth of the fiery dragon that flood of water was discharged. The Pope, as he is now, was at the close of the 4th century the only representative of Belshazzar, or Nimrod, on the earth. For the pagans manifestly accepted him as such. He was equally, of course, the, le le the legitimate successor of the Roman dragon of fire. When Therefore, on being dignified with the title of Pontifex, he set himself to propagate the old Babylonian doctrine of baptismal regeneration, that was just a direct and formal fulfillment of the divine words that the great fiery dragon should, quote, cast out of his mouth a flood of water to carry away the woman with the flood, unquote. He, and those who cooperated with him in this cause, paved the way for the erecting of that tremendous civil and spiritual despotism, which began to stand forth full in the face of Europe in A.D. 606, when, amid the convulsions and confusions of the nations tossed like a temptress sea, the Pope of Rome was made universal bishop. And when the ten chief kingdoms of Europe recognized him as Christ's vicar upon earth, the only center of unity, the only source of stability to their thrones. Then, by his own act and deed, and by the consent of the universal paganism of Rome, he was actually the representative of Dagon. And as he bears upon his head at this day the mitre of Dagon, so there is reason to believe he did then. Now, it is from this period, Alexander continues in a footnote, it is from this period that the well-known 1260 days can begin to be counted. For not before did the Pope appear as head of the ten-horned beast, and head of the universal church. The reader will observe that though the beast above referred to has passed through the sea, it still retains its primitive characteristic. The head of the apostasy at first was Kronos, the horned one. The head of the apostasy is Kronos still, for he is the beast with seven heads and ten horns. Could there then be a more exact fulfillment of chapter 13, verse 1 in the book of Revelation. Quote, and I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the names of blasphemy. And I saw one of his heads as it had been wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wandered after the beast. End of quotation. Could there be an accept, uh, a better fulfillment? All the world wandered after the beast, or as it is stated in another part of Revelation, that all the kings of the world are obedient, subservient to the beast, the Vatican? When we read here, that it was in 606 AD that, as Alexander states here, amid the convulsions and confusions of the nations tossed like a tempter sea, the Pope of Rome was made universal bishop by 606. Now, we read already in Martin Luther that it was Emperor Phocas who gave Pope Boniface III the title of Universal Bishop. I think we read this earlier. If not, well, we're going to come to it. But I think I remember that I did it. You know, when I read this book in German and in English, sometimes 
I'm getting a little bit confused what I have already read and what I haven't. But I think I made that point already. Emperor Phocas, who murdered his predecessor, Emperor Maurice, which we'll also learn a little bit later on in the reading today, was the one who gave the Bishop of Rome at that time the title of Universal Bishop. As Alexander Hislop states here so correctly in his book, The Two Babylons. Now we turn for another explanation to the book of Romanism and the Reformation. And there we read on, uh, I don't know what page, this is uh, 31 in the PDF that I'm using here. It's page 17 in the book, in this kind of copy of the book. We read here by Henry Gretton Guinness, quote, but they recognized their own subjection to the secular power and respected mutually each other's independence. So this is about the bishops talking. Claims to supremacy over other bishops began, however, before long to be advanced by the bishops of Rome, sometimes on one ground and sometimes on another, but it was long before they were admitted. Papal authority indeed made no great progress beyond the bounds of Italy until the end of the 6th century. At this period, the celebrated Gregory I, a talented, active and ambitious man, was Bishop of Rome. He stands at the meeting, uh, he stands at the meeting place of ancient and medieval history and his influence had a marked effect on the growth of Latin Christianity. He exalted his own position very highly in his correspondence and intercourse with other bishops and with the sovereigns of Western Europe with whom he was in constant communication. Claims that had previously been only occasionally suggested were now systematically pressed and urged. He dwelt much on the power conferred by the bishops of Rome in the possession of the keys of the kingdom of heaven, which were committed to Peter and his successors. Well, what Henry Gretton Guinness says here is something that we will go very deeply into the next readings in the book of Martin Luther, because these keys given to him by Matthew 16 is something that, of course, Martin Luther will refute in his work. But Henry Gretton Guinness continues, The Gothic nations were too ignorant to unravel the sophistries of this clever and determined priest, and they permitted him to assume a kind of oversight of their ecclesiastical matters. His successor, so we are speaking about the successor of Gregory, which uh, Martin Luther, which uh, Gregory I, which uh, Henry Gretton Guinness just mentioned here, his successor, Boniface III, carried the pretensions still higher. He was the last of the bishops of Rome and the first of the popes. In the words of Henry Gretton Guinness from 1887 in the book Romanism and the Reformation, we read exactly the same thing that Martin Luther wrote in 1545. He was the last of the bishops of Rome and the first of the popes. In his days, the claim to supremacy over all other bishops was not only definitely made, but it was acknowledged by the secular power and confirmed by an imperial edict. The wicked usurper Phocas, to serve his own selfish purposes, conceded to Boniface III in AD 607, the headship over all the churches of Christendom. A pillar is still standing in Rome today, which was erected in memory of this important concession. This was a tremendous elevation, the first upward step on the ladder that led the bishops of Rome from the humble pastorate of a local church to the mightiest throne in Europe and I like to add, to the mightiest throne in all of the world. So, I'll stop here the quotation from Romanism and the Reformation from Henry Gerton Guinness. I will not go any deeper into the two Babylons of Alexander Hislop. You can get 
both books for free as PDF on the internet and do your own study. Put your Bible next to it, do your own study in history with the help of researchers like Henry Gretton Guinness and Alexander Hislop and also Martin Luther, who all three have not been Seventh-day Adventist influenced as we all have been during our studies. Until a few weeks ago, I even didn't know much better. But the Holy Spirit showed me the truth. And the truth does not come from the Seventh-day Adventists. Now, this was about the point of 606. But how about the point of 1866? Because that's 1260 days. And when it started in 866, it must have ended in 1866. Now, therefore, you can do a Google or whatever search on the Internet. And you can find numerous uh, places where it is stated that in 1866 this stopped. And one of the, uh, uh, of the points, I have to look it up here on my... Uh, on my uh, Firefox browser. I opened that a little bit earlier and uh, then I opened another one. That's the one I'm going to read to you right now. I'm, I'm going to uh, within a second. Um, I, I, I don't find that here. That is about uh, Garibaldi. Uh, so you have to uh, open just a, a internet site um, where it tells you about uh, the history of Garibaldi, life and time of Giuseppe Garibaldi. Here it is. Yeah, I got it. The fall of the papal states was a great fulfillment of Bible prophecy, it says here in this website. In the book of Daniel, chapter 7, God showed Daniel the entire history of the papacy right down to the end of the time. The fourth beast empire, Rome, would be divided up into ten kingdoms or horns, and then another kingdom or little horn would arise in their midst. Now, we all know that is the papacy, right? This little horn was the papal states or papal dynasty, the man of sin of St. Paul's epistles and the Antichrist of the Apostle John. This little horn would have a mouth speaking great things, would make war with the saints and wear them out, would change times and seasons, etc., etc. He would have eyes like the eyes of a man and look more stout than his fellows. That is why the Vatican is called the Sea of Rome. In A.D. 606, the article continues, the Eastern Emperor Phocas conferred upon the Bishop of Rome the title Universal Bishop, as we will also read a little later on in my second um, source that I will give to you. But the point comes now. Universal Bishop. If we use the famous year for a day interpretation which all the great Protestant expositors used, the 1260 years bring us down to 1866. So, the little horn was about to lose his dominion at this momentous time. God had already prepared this soldier, patriot, that he would use to fulfill this great prophecy. His name was Giuseppe Garibaldi, the humble son of a fisherman. I'll see to it that I will put this link into the description box of the video, that you can read this article for yourself. Okay? But it says here, of course, in 1866, leads, uh, he, Garibaldi leads another volunteer army in a new war against Austria, after which Venice is joined to Italy, and in 1867 again attempts a march on Rome, but is beaten by papal and French forces at Mantana, and once again is arrested by the Italian government. So we are speaking about the time of 1866 to 1870. Now, what is my second source that I'm going to read to you? That is from a book called The Catholics and German Unity <coughs> in the time between 1866 and 1871. And from this book, I'm going to read to you a part because this book is not completely free available on the Internet. I can only read to you the part that is readable after I gave a... a, a, a um, uh, a word search in um, that word search is French troops in Vatican 1866 and we read in this book um, that is called the Catholics and German, Uni uh, and German Unity 1866 through 1875 
and we read in this book on page 194, quote, He wrote to Arnhem at Rome in December 1866 that the Catholic fraction was the most hostile group in the Prussian Abgeordnetenhaus, accusing it of an antagonism toward the government which surpassed even that of the Red Democracy. Now, the page before there I cannot see, so this is uh, a little bit a shame that I cannot go a sentence before this, but we continue reading in the next sentence here. Bismarck's conception, uh, Bismarck is the Iron Chancellor, the, the one who united Germany into the Second Reich that endured, had, uh, endured between 1870 and 1918 at the end of World War I. Bismarck's conception of how to deal with this problem reveals one of his few political blind spots. For then, as later, he tended to blame the intransigence of German Catholics directly on the papacy, failing completely to realize that their hostility toward him arose very largely out of resentment of his ruthless destruction of the old order in Germany. It was then, by pressure on the Vatican, that Bismarck first sought to end Catholic opposition. The defeat of Austria had enormously increased the danger that the Italian government might forcibly occupy Rome, particularly since the scheduled departure of French troops in December 1866. This is the important part of the sentence that I was just reading to you that the Italian government might forcibly occupy Rome, particularly since the scheduled departure of French troops in December 1866. So we see, we are speaking a second time already about December 1866 and probably a few weeks later, then we will come into January uh, and February 1867. So this is why the 1260-day year line is between 606, 607 and 1866, 1867. The sentence that I've just read to you is so vital to understand, particularly since the scheduled departure of French troops in December 1866 would leave it practically undefended. Well, that's the point. The Vatican had at that time protective troops to protect them before Garibaldi, which I judged right before you. And those were French troops. But these French troops departed in December of 1866. And by that the Vatican was left defenseless. And that is when the wound got afflicted. I saw one of his heads as it was wounded uh, as it was killed with a deadly wound. One of his heads. The temporal power of the Antichrist was afflicted when the French protecting troops of the Vatican left the Vatican in 1866. Now let us read on in this book. Throughout the fall of that year, the Roman question occupied the attention of Prussian diplomacy while, as has been pointed out, Antichrist Pius IX attempted to arrange a possible sanctuary in the Hohenzollern domain. The letter to Arnhem cited above was the beginning of a not too subtle attempt to blackmail the pontiff, on the assumption that it was within his power to end obstructionism of the Catholic deputies in the Prussian Landtag. Bismarck wrote, quote, if Rome either has not the will or the power to exercise a calming and moderating influence upon its adherents and to make the cause of governments its own, what interest can governments may have in making the cause of the Pope their own? Unquote. It is extremely unlikely that this blackmail could ultimately have succeeded in any case. Bismarck, however, was prevented from carrying it through to a conclusion because of the complex situation which arose as a result of the withdrawal of French troops. 
In the summer of 1867, the old Republican, Gary Baldi, led a filibuster into papal territory and, after twice being captured and twice escaping, on October 27th, he defeated a papal force sent to apprehend him for the third time. The following day, a French detachment debarked at Civita Vecchia and marched again into Rome. A few days later, Garibaldi's troops suffered a crushing defeat at the hands of a combined French and Papal army. Although the Italian government disclaimed any responsibility for Garibaldi's expedition, relations between Florence and Paris naturally became strained. Bismarck, who desired to retain the friendship of Italy, could not therefore act in the Pope's behalf himself. Because he also feared to participate war with France at that time, or over that issue, he could not afford to intervene in favor of Italy. He was forced then officially to maintain a neutral attitude. His official correspondence makes it perfectly clear that the decisive factor in his decision was the possible effect of any action on the 13.5 million German Catholics. On October 21st, he informed Usedom in Florence that he opposed any Prussian intervention to assist Italy in acquiring Rome. Germany's destiny, he explained, was achievable only through a united citizenry. The preservation of religious peace was a prerequisite for that unity and was, therefore, far more important than the possible loss of Italy as an ally. The ultramontane party, he argued, had been hitherto unimportant in Prussia and had not yet succeeded in exercising undue influence south of the main. Now here I will stop, of course, reading this little book excerpt from the Catholics and German Unity 1866 through 1871. As always, I urge you to do your own research. But here we learn of that the French troops retreated. The French troops that were in the Vatican to protect the Vatican of the marching Garibaldi who wanted to make an Italian kingdom, an Italian, an Italian republic, and of course the Vatican sitting in, it, in Italy, he had to take away the power of the Vatican first. That's the whole history, and this is the real affliction of the deadly looking wound that we read of in Revelation 13, from 606 until 1866. This is what we've just read. And I also bookmarked another website where it stood even clearer, uh, uh, even more clearly, very interesting, even with a reference to what happened on September 11th, 9-11 in, I think, 1866 but um, during my preparation time some months ago and reading this today, that website is not to be found anymore so everybody is called, of course, to do his own research on this part and even though I know I have spent now half an hour on this subject, I'm still not done because we are going to continue in Martin Luther's book Against the Roman Papacy and Institution of the Devil on the same subject. But you have to understand that the sources that I just gave you were none of them influenced by Servants' Day Adventist diabolical doctrine. Neither Alexander Hislop nor Henry Gretton Guinness, nor Martin Luther, who state that the time of the reign of the Antichrist was between 606 and 1866, had anything to do with Seventh-day Adventists. Now if you say, oh, Jörg is just ranting on, and I don't, I'm not interested in that, I believe what the Seventh-day Adventists teach, I don't care what you do. I just tell you, that there is another information that clearly puts the Seventh-day Adventist teaching, which is all over the world accepted today, the time between 538 and 1798, puts that into question. That's all you should do. Question everything. Alright?
Now, continue on page 291 in the book from Martin Luther. In addition, he says, St. Gregory, when it, the title Universal Pope, was offered to him by several great bishops, sharply refused it and writes that none of his predecessors had been so bold as to accept or wish to carry such a title. Gregory I, uh, the Pope of, in, in the Roman Catholic Annals, of course, the Pope Gregory I, in Martin Luther's words, the Bishop of Rome, who reigned between 590 and 604 AD, refused the title Universal Pope, Universalis Papa, and wanted to be called Servant of Servants, Servus Servorum. And from another source, I'm going to read to you what actually his point was. It reads here, perhaps Gregory does not know that there is also an ecumenical librarian in Constantinople, a title which essentially means uh, imperial librarian and implies no authority over any other librarian. At any rate, he responds with a warning letter to Emperor Maurice. The Bishop of Rome, Gregory, assures the monarch that he has the unity of the church in mind. He says that despite the pain the title has caused him, he has accepted envoys from John in a spirit of love and humility. Nonetheless, he tells the emperor he has written to John, in, uh, John the Easter, appealing to him to refrain from using the foolish title. He points out that a frivolous thing can be extremely dangerous, as, for example, when Antichrist comes, he will take the name of God, quote, an action at once frivolous and deadly dangerous, unquote. This thought leads him directly into his next assertion, quote, Now I confidently say that whosoever calls himself or desires to be called universal priest is in his elation the precursor of Antichrist, because he proudly puts himself above all others. Unquote. This is what Saint Gregory, as Martin Luther calls him here in this book, says. When Martin Luther just refrains to what I just read to you. In addition, Saint Gregory, when uh, when the title Universal Pope was offered to him by several great bishops, sharply refused it and writes that none of his predecessors had been so bold as to accept or to wish to carry such a title, although the Sixth Council in Chalcedon had offered it to them, he closes by saying briefly and to the point that no one should call himself the highest bishop or head of the whole of Christendom, as many decrees also say, and furthermore, that the Bishop of Rome too, though he is one of the greater ones, is nonetheless not to be called Universalis, the head of all Christendom. This is what Martin Luther says, and in the quote of Gregory I himself, it reads, Now I confidently say that whosoever calls himself or desires to be called Universal priest is in his elation the precursor of Antichrist, because he proudly puts himself above all others. I will probably give you the search links also where I found this. So the point is that Gregory I, the one who preceded Boniface III, and who was bishop under Emperor Maurice, and Maurice was killed by Emperor Phocas, and Phocas put Boniface I, uh, Boniface III on the seat of Pope. That is why Boniface III is called the first Pope. And Gregory I, the one preceding, preceding, sorry, preceding, preceding Boniface III, warned of it, as we have just read, that anyone who will assume universal pontiff or Catholic, universal and Catholic are, of course, interchangeable words, that he will be the precursor of Antichrist, that he actually will be the Antichrist when you put it into the true biblical words. Yeah? 
That's the point that I was making all the time. Now Martin Luther continues here, this is the very plain truth, regardless of how he himself and his hypocrites martyr and crucify these words, for they are too clear and powerful. Thus their deeds are out in the open, for he has never had authority over the bishops of Africa, never had authority over the bishops of Greece, Asia, Egypt, Syria, Persia, etc., and never will have. Indeed, at that time he did not have authority over the bishops in Italy either, especially those of Milan and Ravenna. This Saint Gregory was the last bishop of Rome, Martin Luther says. And the Roman Church has not had another bishop since then, up to the present day, and will not get one either, unless a miraculous change should occur. Instead, vain popes, who are masks of the devil, as you will hear, have ruled there and damaged all the churches physically and spiritually. It is certain, as was said, that at the time of St. Gregory there was no Pope, and he himself, together with his predecessors, did not want to be Pope. Moreover, he condemned the papacy and many of his writings, although he had been painted with a papal crown, and many lies have been made up about him. But he is not a Pope, and does not wish to be a Pope, as his books testify to the disgrace of all the popes who have arisen after him and against him. But after Gregory's death, Sabinianus, and he was pope from 604 through 606, so he was kind of an intermediate, was a bishop for a year and a half, uh, between 604 and 606. I count him, Martin Luther says, among the popes, for he was a big monster, like a pope is, and wanted to burn the books of St. Gregory, his immediate predecessor, perhaps because in his writings St. Gregory did not want the papacy to be tolerated. Boniface III was elected after him. This is when God's wrath began. This Boniface persuaded the regicide focus that he should be pope or chief of all the bishops in the whole world. The bell was cast. This is a German proverb, similar to the English expression, the die was cast. The die was cast then, and the Roman horror accepted with joy, as the one who was now lord over all the bishops in the world. For this is what several of his predecessors had sought and pined for, but had not been able to attain, because St. Gregory and several devout bishops, his predecessors, had not tolerated it. There we have the origin and beginning of the papacy, when and by whom it was founded, namely Emperor Phocas, the regicide, who had his lord Emperor Maurice and his wife and children beheaded. They themselves know very well that these things are true. They, the popes, know that these things are true. Emperor Maurice, who came before Emperor Phocas, was by Emperor Phocas killed. That is regicide. That is the expression that we use for killing of a king or the head of a government. That is regicide. Emperor Maurice, his wife and his children were beheaded by then succeeding Emperor Phocas. Emperor Phocas then put the successor of St. Gregory, Boniface III, on the chair of the Pope. This is how the Antichrist, this is how the Pope got the title Universal Bishop, Pontifex Maximus, in 606. This, my dear brethren, is real, unbridled, not through SDA glasses, sawn history. 
Now up to that time, Martin Luther continues, it had been the custom for the emperors as patrons to confirm all the bishops. For when St. Gregory was elected by the people and priests of Rome, he asked for Emperor Maurice in writing not to confirm his election, for he was a humble, devout man and did not wish to become bishop. But his writing was intercepted and Emperor Maurice confirmed his election against his will. Thereafter, the popes thought that since they had the papacy from the emperor Phocas, perhaps another emperor might take it from them again. So, <laughs> the popes have the same fear as we all know that rights or titles are given by men can be taken by man. So the Pope said, this has been given to us by the Emperor, Focus, so maybe the Emperor can also take it away. So then, there's only one way out. We have to be above the Emperor. Now, Thereafter, the popes thought that since they had the papacy from the emperor Phocas, perhaps another emperor might take it from them again. For so it must be in the worldly sphere that if an emperor gives out grace, then he may take it back, if the wickedness of the possessors merits it. This is how German emperors Frederick, Lothar and the Ottos and there we read in a footnote, probably this is about Frederick I, who reigned between 1152 and 1190, Lothar I between 1125 and 1137, and Otto I between 936 and 973, and Otto II, 973 through 983, and again his successor, Otto III, 983 through 1002, have often taken from the princes what they had given them and returned it after repentance. Point Martin Luther makes here. The German emperors Frederick Lothar and the three Ottos have often taken from the princes who are subservient to the emperor, like the um, chiefs of government of the German Bundesländer are subservient to the chancellor in a way, like probably in the United States of America, the senators are subservient to the President of the United States of America. This is how these German emperors, Frederick Lothar and the three Ottos, have often taken from the princes what they had given them. First you give them, grant them something, and as long as they do their bidding, it's okay. But oh, watch out when they do not adhere to what you are ordering them anymore. When you go out of the role, then your power is taken away. Exactly the same thing that a few hundred years later the Pope did with, um, uh, with the German, uh, uh, with the German um, Kaiser Henry. That was the way to Canossa that we can deal another way with, you know? The same thing. So, when someone does not adhere anymore to the power that has given him the power, then the power is taken away. Exactly what Martin Luther says here. This is how German emperors Frederick Lothar and the Ottos have often taken from the princes what they had given them, and returned it after repentance. So, when the Kaiser can give this to the princes and take it away, then also the Kaiser can give it to the Pope and take it away, and that's of course something the Popes did not want. That is why the succeeding popes came along and did not want to have the papacy from emperor or council, but directly from God. So now, you understand, the papacy has been given its power by the temporal power, by the emperor, or by a council. Boniface III has been made universal bishop by Emperor Phocas. But now, now the papacy says, we cannot allow an emperor or a council to give this to us. Now we have to make it appear as if it was divinely ordained, as if we were given this power directly from God. They made one decree after another, 
boasting, shouting and roaring that the Roman Catholic Church and the Pope were not founded by men, meaning emperors, or by councils, but instituted by Christ himself over the whole world. Now, how did they do that? They particularly like to embellish themselves with the passage in Matthew 16, verses 18 through 19. Quote, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, etc. They also quote this from John Ultimo, meaning the last chapter of John 21, verse 15, quote, Feed my lambs. But they have achieved the most with the passage in Matthew 16 with which they have frightened the world, suppressed all the bishoprics, and trampled the emperors and the secular government underfoot. Now these abominable liars and blasphemers of God's word knew very well, and still know very well, that this passage does not prove their point, nor is it relevant. Every letter in it is against them, drives the papacy into the ground and vitiates it, as I argued 25 years ago in the resolutions and in public disputations against Dr. Sau in Leipzig, where we can read, of course, that Martin Luther is here referring to the Leipzig debate in 1519, huh? 25 years ago, to 1544, 1545, he was probably writing this book in 1544, when he was publishing it in 1545, the Leipzig debate in 1519, in which Martin Luther and John Eck argued the authority of the Pope and the jurisdiction of the Church of Rome. So Martin Luther has a long history of arguing with other people about the authority and the jurisdiction of the Church of Rome. Because the Church of Rome has gotten this from the temporal power, from emperors and not from Christ. But they claim apostolic succession. They claim that their office, the papacy, is divinely ordained. And it's not. And Martin Luther had discussions already with that, with uh, John Eck, in 1519. Luther frequently calls Eck Dr. Sau. So, that's the name that, I will, that we will read more often in this book. As Martin Luther says here, in public disputation against Dr. Sau in Leipzig and intended to go on doing hereafter. But it was balm to the hearts of these desperate scoundrels in Rome that the world, both bishops and emperors, let themselves be frightened and intimidated by this passage, as befits good Christians who did not want to act against God and his word. For this is the Pope's first rascality and blasphemy against God's holy words. So because the Pope says he is ordained by God, by Matthew chapter 16 verses 18 and 19, and by John 21 verse 15, to be the universal bishop, to be the head of all the churches all over the world, to be the bishops of bishops, and of course to be the king of kings, nobody from quote-unquote Christianity dares to go against the Pope. You do not want to act against the word of God, right? No, you don't want to act against the word of God, but you want to see if somebody is misusing the word of God for his purposes. And this is exactly what the papacy did. And he not only did that for the 1260 days or years, he still does that today. When they now saw that such rascality had succeeded, because the Pope just made claim to this Bible verses to claim that their power comes from them, not from the emperor or from a council, but from the Bible, 
and nobody disputes them. So when they now saw that such rascality had succeeded, through God's terrible wrath over the world because of its sinfulness, and that everyone was afraid of such words, they were truly neither lazy nor sleepy, and, comforted, pressed on with every nevery and help of the devil. They began to interpret, they began to sharpen and strengthen their papacy or primacy, which they had founded through their own invented lying decree and through blasphemous false and rascally exegesis of the passage in Matthew 16 by saying that the Pope was the head not only because of honor and rank, which would probably have been granted to him, and because of superintendence, that he was an overseer of the teaching and heresy in the church, which is much too much for a single bishop, and impossible to do throughout the whole world, but because with the power that he had as their lord, he could force the bishops into subjection, into a powerful and worldly indeed, even a tyrannical fashion, could bind them with oaths and obligations, make them vassals, take their bishops' ricks, enthrone and depose, change, steal, take, give, assess and sell them, as well as burden them most high-handedly with pallia, anates and countless chicaneries. chicaneries. Whoever refused to do or tolerate this had to be condemned eternally as disobedient to the Roman Church, a heretic and one who sinned against the passage in Matthew 16. This is where we come to an end of today's reading. And I can assure you that we are going to continue and read the complete book. But I want to ask your discernment that you really understood what I just read here. Whoever refused to or tolerate this, meaning the teaching of the Pope, the teaching of the Roman Catholic hierarchy, had to be condemned eternally as disobedient to the Roman Church, a heretic and one who sinned against the passage of Matthew 16. Meaning, when you refuse or tolerate the Pope's teaching, you sin against the Bible, you are a heretic. This is what this last sentence means. Whereas, biblically, of course, a heretic is one who refuses to adhere to the written word of God, the Bible. Now, I've come to 57 minutes and I think this was hard enough for a lot of you and maybe some people are in need of watching this two, three or even four times to understand and study your own history of the 1260 days and you will see that what I told you here today without the glasses of Seventh-day Adventists on, the real 1260-day year prophecy, three and a half years, 42 months, was between 606 and 1866, and not 538 through 1798. One last thought on this. 1866 is the time when Pope Pius IX was the emperor, uh, was, was the emperor, was the Pope of Rome, was the Antichrist. When they lost their power in 1866 because of the withdrawal of the French troops from the Vatican, they closed the Vatican doors, they started the First Vatican Council because they still had the spiritual power, and then the Pope was declared infallible in 1870, and they closed the Vatican doors as a prison from the inside. Between 1870 and 1929, when the wound was healed through the Lateran, uh, through the Lateran uh, court with Mussolini, no Pope left the Vatican. 
When they were elected in their position, they did not leave. The Vatican became a prison from the, with a key from the inside, because the Pope lost his temporal power. And that was between 1866 and 1929. So, I leave you with some things to reflect on, and read on, and study on, and as I always say, please do your own research. Jörg from Joggler 66, Hour of the Truth says, God bless you. Until next time. Bye bye. <laughs>